I said in the uh, liturgy earlier, we have, a, uh, we have a group that is visiting us from Archangel Michael Church up in Howell, New Jersey, led by Father Isaac. And there's a group of New Jersey people. The New Jersey people here somewhere today? Anyone here from New Jersey? Okay, over there. Give a big hand to the New Jersey people. Very good. Very good. And like I said in the church, if you see anyone that looks like they're from Jersey, just go ahead and say hi to them and welcome them, okay? And we all know you can tell if someone's from Jersey, so just go ahead and... Very good. Just joking, just joking. Okay, so actually I was sitting with the, the group from Jersey on Friday night. We were hanging out in the college youth meeting. And the subject that, you know, was kind of, we were discussing together was... was Obviously, recently, there's been a lot of talk about martyrdom and persecution. And we were discussing, you know, some issues about, you know, martyrdom and persecution. And, and I, I kind of realized that there's like this thought that may be going through some people's heads that I want to kind of clear up and just kind of make sure we all have a proper understanding of it. There's this idea that they were saying, because you know how we talk about how, like obviously, you know, the events that took place in Egypt, we talk about, they became martyrs, and they were, they were martyrs for their faith because they were killed for being Christian. And you know, in Christianity, martyrdom is like the highest rank that you can attain. The Bible talks about those who shed their blood for Christ have a very, very special place up in heaven. So the, the debate between some of the people was, can I live whatever kind of life that I want as miserable and as wicked and as horrible, and then just kind of walk into a situation where there's some martyrdom going on, and like, I just happen to be at the right place, or wrong place, depending on how you look at it, and I find myself, I got killed, and there you go, straight shot to heaven. Is that how it works? That basically, anyone can do anything, and then you know what, let me just live a wicked life, and we just have fun, and then, you know, when I decide it's time to die, I'll just run over to Saudi Arabia, one of those places, say I'm a Christian, and boom, one-way ticket, straight upstairs. What I'm going to do today, like I told them I was talking on Friday night, I want to discuss today, not martyrdom so much, but I want to discuss a little bit about the idea of persecution, and I do not... As I said before, I do not want to make any political statements today. I'm not a political guy. I don't want to talk about any specific people or specific situations, about anywhere or anything. So please don't take anything I'm saying and apply it in, in a weird kind of a way. I want to talk in a general kind of way about the concept of persecution and how we as Christians relate to persecution and what's, our relation, what's the relationship between me and persecution? Okay? I want to talk from the Bible. I want to look at the words of Christ. I don't want to look at any specific situations or make any political statements. As a Christian, is it a requirement that I'm persecuted? Like, can I be a Christian and not be persecuted for my faith? The key in answering that question is knowing the difference between suffering and persecution. Suffering is not the same as persecution. Agree? There's a difference, okay, between suffering and persecution. If I had to come up with a very elementary school definition, of what's the difference between suffering and persecution? I would say this. Suffering is when bad stuff happens to you. I get hit by a bus. I get cancer. I trip and fall and break my nose. My team loses in overtime. Suffering. Persecution is different. Persecution is not bad stuff happens to you. Persecution is bad guys do bad stuff to you. Difference. As Christians, we all know suffering is part of life. There are trials in life. There are difficulties. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. The Lord said, my path is not wide and easy. My path is narrow and it's straight and it's difficult and few find it. But persecution is like a step further where someone is going out of their way to make you suffer and to do bad stuff to you. So when I hear that definition, I would say, okay, like, suffering, we all have that. But persecution, like, I'm in America, I'm not in Egypt, I'm not like 
in, in China or any of those places. So persecution doesn't necessarily need to be part of my life, right? Like I can be a good person. I can read my Bible. I can go to church. I put a little money in the little money box. I do my fasting. I do my prayers. And persecution, you know, it's just like it's something we hear about. It's not like really applicable to me and you. Because let's be honest, me and you hear about the persecution that goes on in Egypt, all right, or even 10,000 times worse, places like Sudan and Indonesia and China, okay, places like 100 times worse than anywhere. And we really can't relate to that. And we say, like, that's like, that might as well be on the moon as far as I'm concerned. I can live a good life without being persecuted, right? Let me say better. I can live godly without being persecuted, right? Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That verse stands right there. You know how Christ said the way is narrow and few find it? Oftentimes you run into a verse in the Bible that's just like that. Here's the road, okay, and I want to get to God. And I want to try to get around this, but I can't get around it. So I try to go this way, and I try to go under it, and I try to go over it. And I try to somehow get around the, these verses. And this is one of those verses that stands straight in a way, says, Godly persecution. How? How can that be? How can that be? Because we don't get persecuted. We don't. Like, I live in America. Does that mean we all have to move to Egypt? God forbid, we all have to move back to Egypt. Does that mean, is that what that means? We have to go live in one of those places? How does it mean that I'm going to live here and I'm supposed to suffer persecution? I want to take this concept of persecution, and again, I want to go biblically and figuring out what it's supposed to be and what's my relationship supposed to be. First thing that I'll tell you, which you probably wouldn't agree with on surface level, but we're going to look today in the Bible and see that persecution is a gift and it's a blessing of God. Persecution is a source of God's blessing in my life. How can I say that? Well, the Bible says it. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 is a passage where St. Paul is speaking about his own persecution and about the persecution of the church in Philippi. And he's saying, you guys have a lot of enemies. A lot of people are attacking you. A lot of people standing in your way because you believe in the truth and you're following the truth. And a lot of people are doing that to me. And he's basically saying, don't worry about me. I'm okay. Look what he says. Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ... Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ. What does the phrase on behalf of Christ mean? What does that mean? If I say to you, here's a cup of coffee. And I say, no, 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 no. This cup is on behalf of Mr. Starbuck himself. This cup is on behalf of the inventor of... This cup, this envelope is on behalf of the President of the United States of America. What does that mean? That means, yeah, oh my goodness, something special. Oh my goodness, it was given to me on behalf of Christ. Not just thrown at me, like we oftentimes think like, eh, hey, take that. No, 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 no. It's like Christ wrapped it, a little bow, a little sticker, a piece of tape, whatever. Put a bunch of stuff and he said, here, your enemy is giving this persecution to you, but it's on behalf of Christ. Does Christ give bad gifts? He only gives good gifts. Even worse, or even stronger verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can't get any more blunt than this. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Persecution equals blessing. I'm not making political statements. I'm not saying anything about anyone. I'm speaking the Bible. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Goes on to expound upon it. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want to break down this verse here today and understand how persecution equals blessing. How persecution should lead to rejoice and be glad. Because let's be honest, we don't look at it that way. We look at blessing, this is one of the, the, the myths of, that we've created in Christianity. 
Blessing equals comfort. Blessing equals easy life. Blessing equals promotion. That's what we've done to the word blessing. We've taken the word blessing and said blessing equals promotion. Blessing equals 4.0. Blessing equals big house. Look at the blessing of God. And then when we don't have those things, God, why aren't you blessing my life? We've taken blessing and we made it into a materialistic, a selfish, a self-centered, a convenient comfort thing for me. We've taken that word blessing and totally watered it down. Pray that God would bless me. And all we're talking about is materialistic things. He says blessing equals persecution. You see, in this passage in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. All right? And this piece that we just read is the conclusion of the first, like, like topic in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins with the blesses, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay? It talks about what a life of Christianity is all about. Be pure. Be peacemaker. Be poor in spirit. Be meek. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then the very, very last one, our Lord Jesus Christ is very realistic. He's not, he's not idealistic. He's realistic. And he says, you know what? If you do those seven things, then I guarantee you there's going to be some people who are not going to like you. I guarantee you. There's going to be some people who are going to talk bad about you. And who are not going to promote you to the highest position. And who are not going to include you in the little tea parties when they have their little friends over. There's going to be some people who dislike you. They will insult you. And they will say bad stuff about you. And he says, when that happens, smile. Because you know you're doing something right. Of all the Beatitudes, all the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is this. Blessed is the this, for theirs is this. This is the only of the, one of the Beatitudes that he expounds on. Okay, he gives it in the first one, blessed are the persecutor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he expounds on it. He gives more space to this one than any other one. And what he also does, which I love here, is he personalizes it. All of the other ones were, blessed are the poor, for they will find this. Blessed are those who are this, because they will receive this. And then here he says, forget about them. Now you, blessed are you. He's trying to show them that this is not a them thing. This is a you thing. Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when people persecute you. Blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. But the key to the blessing of persecution, kind of like I spoke about today in the sermon for those who are there in the liturgy, the key is not the persecution. The key is the response to the persecution. And what I want every single person here to realize today is that it is inevitable that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Just because you ain't seen it yet, don't hold your breath. You haven't seen it yet? Great, thank God. Be prepared. Because just because it hasn't rained yesterday and the day before and the day before, be prepared. Every day that goes by that it doesn't rain makes a greater likelihood that it's going to rain. And Lord Jesus Christ is saying the same thing. Because sometimes he gives us periods where there is no persecution. Hey, that's great. But don't get too comfortable in it. Because all who desire to live godly, if you're really serious about obeying what God tells you to do, it is inevitable. You are going to find people who don't like it. You're going to find people who don't like you. And we should be prepared for that and be prepared to respond in the proper way so that when it happens, I receive the blessing. Because the Bible says great things about great reward, great blessing, rejoicing. But I must make sure that I respond in the proper way. Because if I don't respond in the proper way, I'm going to find myself in the opposite situation. Don't be caught surprised. The Bible doesn't say, blessed are you if people insult you. It says, blessed are you when. Because he knows it's an inevitable fact of life. So let's break it down and understand how I can respond to my persecution. And notice in the title of the talk, I didn't even have the guts to put persecution because I believe that Christians in Egypt are persecuted. Christians in China are persecuted. I can't use the same word to describe what's happening to us here. Because anything for us 
is like 10,000 degrees lower. It's really, really watered down. So I would say at most, we would be slightly inconvenienced or harassed for our faith. But I can't say we're persecuted. I can't put myself on the same level. Because what we're talking about is people, like I said, not liking us. Or we're talking about people like not inviting us to their parties. We're talking about a much, much lower level of persecution that's going on over there. But the key to it that I want everyone to be clear with before I get into it is the key is it's talking about persecuted, look, insulted, persecuted, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Because of me. Because of Christ. There's different kinds of persecution. There's different kinds of harassment. There's sexual harassment. There's racial harassment. He's not talking about just people don't like you. Some of you are just annoying people, and that's why people don't like you. And we say that's racism, and that's harassment, that's persecution. That's just because you're annoyed. If you're nosy, okay, if you're whatever, that's a different situation. I'm talking about persecuted because of me, because of Christ. And there's a big difference between the, right, between the two. I always think about, y'all seen the movie Teen Wolf? Y'all seen Teen Wolf? Okay. If you haven't seen Teen Wolf, you drop everything tonight. After the playoffs are over, you go get yourself Teen Wolf. The first one, the original, okay, because it's the real deal. In Teen Wolf, okay, the premise of the movie is that Michael J. Fox, okay, is a boy who's really a wolf, okay? Back in the 80s, there were, we weren't that complicated, okay? Our movies were simple. A boy who's a wolf. And then the principal of the school, if you remember, was always on his case, and he hated his guts. Why? Why did the principal hate the Teen Wolf's guts? Who remembers? Very good, because of his father, okay? Very good. Okay, a child of the 80s, very good, unite, children of the 80s. Because of his father, because the principal went to school with the father, who also was a wolf, okay, and they had a little altercation at some point in time. So the principal continued to take it out on the child. That's what the kind of persecution that we're talking about is, is that people persecute me because I'm a child of God, not just because I'm an annoying person. That because I'm child of Jesus, people hate Jesus, so they will hate me. That's the kind of persecution I'm talking about. Not just inconvenience or anything like that. And the truth is, is that if you love Jesus, and if you get close to him, and you are truly his son, it is inevitable that people won't like you. You know why? Because darkness doesn't like light. You know, like, when you're, like, asleep, all right, and, you're, and someone comes to on the light, you're like, ah, you hate them, okay? You want to throw something at them and throw something at the light to shut the light. It hurts. Well, in that world of darkness out there, if we walk around full of light, people won't like it. They'll say, stop, turn off the light. That's what they did to Jesus. Jesus walked around as a bright light, and the people who were in darkness said, go away, go away, go away. He wouldn't go away. He stood strong. So what did they do? They killed him. Because they either had to face the light, which they couldn't, because they were in darkness, or they had to kill him. And it's the same thing for me and you. You don't believe me? That people hate the light? Do this. Go out in, into, the, into the mall, or into a crowded place of people, and stand up and say, I am a Christian, and sex before marriage is wrong! And anyone who believes otherwise is sinning! Tell me what people will do to you. Go stand up at one of these foolish movies that talks about all kinds of nonsense and all kinds of crude stuff where people are laughing and stand in the middle of the movie theater and say, this movie is against the rules of God and against the principles of Christianity. You don't think people will throw stuff at you? People don't like light when they're in darkness. So, to anyone who says today that they don't need this message... I'm worried. Oh my goodness, speaking of darkness. Right. To anyone today who says, I don't need this message, I don't have to worry about being harassed or persecuted, I ask you how much light you're full of. John 15, verse 20. A servant, that's you, is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
And you know what? If I look at Christ, and my job as a Christian is to be like Christ, no one ever hassles me about living for Christ. No one ever gives me a hard time. No one ever, I'm the most, po- I'm a Mr. Universe. I'm the most popular person, and, and no one, I got to ask myself, how much am I like my master? How much am I like him? If the darkness embraces me and makes me the ruler and says, you're number one, and the, and the people of darkness, what's that say about my light? I'm just saying. If you're no different than everybody else, maybe that's not necessarily such a good thing. I'm going to go today with the assumption that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, and that if you're serious about your walk with the Lord, it's going to come a point in time. Again, may not have been today, and it may not be tomorrow, but it's going to come where you're going to have to make a choice between people and their approval and their opinion and their liking of you or the truth. And if you make that right decision, what should be our response to the inconveniences, the persecutions, the harassment that we suffer? Two things. First thing and most important thing, and it is very important that we understand this, especially when times get heated, is we refuse to retaliate. We never, ever retaliate. Again, it's not my opinion. I'm not making a political statement. I'm telling you the Bible. Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The one who retaliates against evil is sinning. The one who retaliates against evil is sinning. I'm not saying we don't take action. I'm going to talk about that later. But retaliate means you, me, and then I, you. Retaliate means you, me, and then I, you. We don't retaliate. We take action. We'll discuss that later. But the first thing, we do not retaliate. Why? Why is it so important that we remember not to retaliate? It is so important. And if you do, you are missing out on this critical spiritual truth. When you retaliate and you hurt a person, you miss the enemy. You missed it. Your enemy ain't a person. Your enemy is not a person. Your enemy is much bigger. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hopes of wickedness in the heavenly places. You're making a critical mistake of war when you retaliate. You're fighting against the wrong enemy. That's like Canada comes and bombs me, and I say, okay, you know what? Here you go. I'm going to take it out on Mexico. What Mexico had to do with Canada? That's what we do. There's not human beings that are your enemy, and if you think that, you're wrong. You're 100% wrong. It's the devil. It's the kingdom of darkness. And when you retaliate, he wins. That's, the, that's what I'm saying. That's like fighting against yourself. You're helping your enemy when you retaliate evil for evil. That's what the enemy wants. You got to like look past. I know it's hard when we're emotional, but I'm trying to take a non-emotional biblical look. We got to look past the person in front of me. If the person in front of me says, I hate you because you're a Christian, that's not the enemy. The enemy is the one who's behind him, who's over his left shoulder, who's in his ear. That's his enemy. And that enemy is not overcome by evil. That enemy becomes stronger when there's evil. So you are hurting the cause of Christianity when you retaliate evil for evil. We read in that verse that we should expect, said three things insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you. That's what the world is going to do. Expect it. I should expect to be insulted. And when I'm insulted, I will not insult back. I should expect to be persecuted. When I'm persecuted, I won't persecute back. 
I should expect that people will falsely say all kinds of stuff against me. And I won't respond back with lies. You don't see that in the world today. You don't see that the world would love to insult a Christian. Look, let me tell you this. If two people commit the sin of adultery, one is a Joe Schmo, the other is a pastor. Which one do you think is going to be in the news more? Which one do you think people are going to be talking about over the water cooler? People would love, love, love to find our faults and to talk bad stuff about us. And when you retaliate, you just give them more stuff to talk about. Did people ever falsely say stuff about Christ? What kind of false stuff did they say about him? Remember when they said that he is a, a, a friend of sinners and a wine bibber? Okay, you know what wine bibber means? It means a drunk. Okay, they're basically saying like, you trust this man? All he is is he just parties all the time. He's, a, he's like, he's a, he's a frat boy party guy. He's a party animal. You trust him? How do you respond? He didn't open his mouth. He doesn't respond because he knows that's not how we respond. Okay? I can see the steam come out of some people's ears. No, we should respond. And we should. I'm not saying don't respond. I'm saying don't retaliate. First thing is we take control. We don't eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But now we need to respond. We should respond. We should take action. I agree. But we respond positively, not negatively. We respond positively, not negatively. Again, I'm not inventing this stuff. This is the Bible. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When evil turns up the temperature, evil turns up the temperature, good needs to turn up the temperature more. And evil, and then good. And then evil, and then good. And as the world gets closer and closer to the end, one of the things that we know will happen, okay, is that the bad will get badder and the good will get gooder. Okay? Just go with me for the sake of, Okay? The wicked, the kingdom of wickedness, will become much more wicked. And you see that all around you. You see that all around you. But the kingdom of light will also get stronger. And that's the way it goes. Maybe 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe it was like this to like this. Okay? But as the kingdom of wickedness, the kingdom of light needs to turn up. And sometimes it's the opposite, that the light turns up, so the wicked tries to catch up. This is the battle that's going on in heavenly places, in spiritual realms that you may not see. Once you respond in a negative way, like retaliate eye for eye, tooth for tooth, what you have done is you have lost control. And you have ceased from becoming, like in science, there is action and then reaction, right? Scientists, there's an action and then a reaction. So we can take the same thing and say there are actors and reactors. And I do not want to be a reactor. A reactor is someone, you punch me in the face, I punch you in the face. You smile at me, I smile at you. That's the way most people are. You're nice to me, I'm nice to you. You're mean to me, I'm mean to you. That's the way most people are. An actor says, I am going to love you no matter what you do to me. I am going to be kind, long-suffering, gracious, regardless. And this is what I always say. This is what you need to do. You need to take control of your life. How many people wake up in the morning and say, today is going to be a day. I'm going to live up here. You get in the car. The guy cuts you off. You spill the coffee. Your boss, the email, and you're down here the rest of the day. You know what happened? You lost control. You let the idiot on 495, you let your idiot boss, you let all the idiots around you control your day. You ceased from being an actor. You became a reactor. I'm going to say, no, I'm an actor. I'm going to smile this day. I don't care what you do. Nothing's going to make me stop smiling. Nothing you do can make me stop smiling. <clears throat> so we should respond positively. How? Practically. This is the one. Some people, just keep yourselves. Okay? This is the Bible. 
How do we respond positively? Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. How can we love them? And how can we pray for them? They're wicked. There it is. It's not me. I'm not giving an editorial today. It's the Bible. Okay, Jesus. Can Jesus do this? Would you do that? Let's see, what would Jesus do if someone tried to kill him and beat him badly and disrespected him in front of everyone and hung him out to dry? What would he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So that's the thing about Christ that gets you every time. Is that he did all the stuff that he tells us to do. With our parents, we used to say, well, you do it. Okay, and they wouldn't, in, but with him, he did it. He did it. And again, in all fairness, don't be offended. But it's hard for me to call the stuff that we do persecution. It's hard for me to say, okay, well, if Christ on the cross, then I guess I can be nice to my idiot boss. It's hard for me to put the two on the same level. But what I'm saying, baby steps, baby steps. Start with your idiot boss. He's an idiot. He's always been an idiot. He'll be an idiot for life. You're not going to change that. You don't retaliate. You don't talk bad about him behind his back. You love him. You bless him. You do good to him. And you pray for him. Please, God, help my boss stop being such an idiot. You know what happens when you do that? Who's in control of the situation now? Who's in control? I'm in control. I'm in control. And I choose what the situation is happening here. And I say, number one thing in life is I'm good with God. There's no way I'm going to let you or you or you or you or anyone get between me and God. And that's what we allow when we retaliate evil for evil. We respond with good. I'm not saying we don't take action. Y'all heard me say, sign the petitions. Do your, I'm not saying don't do that. But what I'm saying is we never, ever lose control of our values and who we are. You cannot control the circumstances that happen to you in life. But you can 100% control your response to any circumstance that takes place. Now I'm really going to get you. I'm really going to get you. Let's say you accept, love, bless, do good, and pray. Let's say, you, let's say you can accept that. But the true test of putting your money where your mouth is, is the Lord told us to do something else. What else did he tell us to do when we're persecuted? That was in the verse I brought you earlier. It said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then he gave us a commandment. Do something. What did he tell us to do? Rejoice. Rejoice. How? I can accept. But don't talk to me about no rejoice. Rejoice. How can I rejoice and be glad in a time when I'm being persecuted and I'm suffering? How? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, you should rejoice because it means people can see God in your life. It means there's something that's right in your life. Why we rejoice, okay, like the big picture, is because we are not dealing in promotions and, and, and success on this earth as the main thing. We're looking much broader. We have a bigger perspective. And when I first thing I do is I rejoice because it means I'm doing something right. There's some kind of light that, hallelujah, praise the Lord, there's light in my life. I mean, something good is taking place here. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If there's no persecution, like I said, then you've got to ask yourself, is there any light inside me? 
But if there is, then the first thing is I say, thank you, God, I must be doing something right. Today, there are too many secret agent spy Christians in the world. Undercover agents, where no one knows we're Christian, and no one can detect it, and we got all our bases covered, so no one will ever discover that we're really Christians. Too many undercover agents in the world today. I read this in a book one time. It said the following. It said, if today the President of the United States of America declares that it is illegal to be Christian, if today it becomes illegal to be Christian, would anyone accuse you? Would anyone say anything about you? Even worse, if you're on trial for being Christian, is there any evidence? Or is it just hearsay? <laughs> any evidence to prove it? Or <laughs> just... <laughs> anyway, you can take the thing as far as you want. First thing, I rejoice. Thank you, God. Something good in my life. There's some light in my life. Second thing, I rejoice. Because again, I'm broad-minded here. I'm spiritual-minded. I'm not here. I'm here. And I realize this is an honor given to me by God. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. The apostles, the first century church, the guys who knew Jesus the best, look what happened when they got persecuted. So they, this is a time after they got beaten, okay, with rods and they were imprisoned, and then they were eventually let go after another beating. And said so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Man, we, we don't have that spirit. I want to say, okay, now I'll tell you my opinion about something. Okay, so overall, I'm speaking the Bible. Now I'll tell you my opinion about something, and I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. The persecution that happens. Okay, so let's agree there's real persecution in the world that's much worse. We don't have real persecution here. Egypt has real persecution. And then let's agree there's places, other places in the world that are like even a billion times worse. And I hope that through like what all the stuff that's happening in Egypt, a lot of people's eyes have been opened that like it's not just Egypt. Like there's Christians being persecuted all over the world and we got to open our eyes and see all this stuff and not live in our little bubble. The people that often live in these persecuted cities and countries and are in the midst of real persecution, the people that if they go to church, they know they're really, really risking their lives. Really. Those people, the persecution doesn't bother them as much as it bothers us here. That's my theory. You know why? Because they know this. They know this. We're the ones, we don't know this. Because we water down the word persecution. I met one time with a real evangelist who used to go to places like China and Malaysia. And really, he was saying, like, like walking in the street, really, he could lose his life because he's a known evangelist. Okay? When you, when I, when you hear, the, I say the word evangelist, we think of the guys on TV on Sunday morning asking for money. That's not an evangelist. An evangelist is someone who knows. He could be killed. But those people, those people know it's an honor. Those people rejoice that they're counted worthy to suffer for his name. Our problem is here. We get further and further. We get into our comfort. We get into our little whatever. And we don't want anyone to touch us. So we go ballistic when we find anyone encroaching on our little castle and our little kingdom that we built for ourselves, full of comfort and recliners and, 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 and iPods and, and, and plasma TVs and, 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 and Starbucks. And we don't want anyone to come near that little bubble that we live in. Third, third. No matter what kind of persecution takes place, I know it's only temporary. I know it's only temporary. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, St. Paul said it. He said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What St. Paul is telling us here is we need to get some perspective. Some perspective on life. On 60, 70, 80 years versus eternity. We need to get some perspective. Because sometimes you're too close to the puzzle to be able to get the perspective. And when you get the perspective, and you see the 70, 80 years, and you compare the eternity, then you can rejoice. Then you can have the ability to be glad in these situations. Let me give you an example that I hope you know this example. I hope that you have lived this example in some way, shape, or form. All of us, before we became close to God, we cared about things in the world much more. And I hope that as you get closer to God, you care about things in the world less. I can say, for me, that's, that's definitely been true, and I, and I would assume for many people here as well, that as I get closer to God, the perspective changes. I know people, and I, again, I, I assume some of you people here can say the same thing. Before we knew God, someone dented our car, woo! Someone scratched my car, woof! Watch out! Scratch your face if you scratch my car. Because that's my car. And how could you get in my car? And it's my car. And it's my car. Eternal perspective. It's just a car. You see what I'm saying? And before, it used to be no and fight for this. And how dare he say this? And how? Oh my goodness. And then when you get some perspective. Right? Is it just me? Like, you gain perspective, and the stuff that we used to care really, really so much about, and we used to fight someone and punch them in the face if they try to go near it. Now, all of a sudden, you get perspective. That's a car. That's a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks, all right, that's a hundred bucks. You know what I'm saying? We need to have that same perspective on persecution. Have the same perspective on life of harassment for our faith. It's only temporary. And we shouldn't get ourselves all worked up and in a bunch just for the sake of it. Someone insults you. Eh. Someone says something, disrespects you in front of someone else twice on your birthday. Eh. There's an expression in Arabic, enlarge in your head, okay? Y'all know that one? Enlarge in your head. Okay? Y'all know that one? Okay? It doesn't sound as cool in English, but in Arabic it's really cool. Okay? Okay? Make your head bigger in a positive way. Someone once told me that their favorite verse in the Bible is the, is, is the phrase, and it came to pass. And everything comes to pass. No matter what it is, it'll pass. We don't get ourselves worked up about things here on the earth so much. We keep eternal perspective on things. And we're going to tie that. It's only temporary to number four. You will be rewarded. <clears throat> if I talked all day, which I'm not going to, but if I talked all day about the reward that is awaiting you, it wouldn't do it justice. Look, I always say, the Bible doesn't exaggerate. When the Bible uses a word, it is precise, and it gives its exact meaning. When the Bible says, great is your reward in heaven, then you must assume that that means there are rewards in heaven, and then great rewards in heaven. And when the Lord says, great is your reward, I don't think that there's going to be one person, when all is said and done, that gets to the end and says, the Lord gypped me. No one is going to get to the end and say, the Lord was unfair with me. I had this much suffering and only this much reward. Not one person will say that. The Lord, when he repays, he repays. On the plus side and on the minus side. When the Lord repays, he repays. And you've got to realize that and keep that in mind. What did Jesus say? He said, For in like manner your father, their, their fathers did to the prophets. Great is your reward in heaven, because they also did the same thing to the prophets. So you're telling me that when I'm persecuted, my reward is so great, I can stand next to Jeremiah, 
and Isaiah and Elijah and Obadiah. I could stand in there. I could sneak my little head in there and stick my head in there. Oh, that's great. That's great. I would love that. Nothing on this earth is so bad that it would, it would make me say that sticking my head between Isaiah and Jeremiah would be a bad thing. Romans chapter 8 verse, seven, oh, chapter 8 verse 17 says, We are children of God. If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him. Don't ever let anything that happens here on this earth remove your focus from the eternal perspective. The Bible says if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. Oh my goodness. What does that mean? Like, you want to take a verse, and a verse that makes your mind spin around itself? Play with this verse for a little bit. Play with this verse. You know the verse? There's a verse in the Bible that talks about meditate on my words. Okay, the word meditate literally comes from a word that means chew over and over. Okay, it means like, like you know what I mean? Like, like, take this verse and chew on this verse. What in the world does this mean? If indeed we suffer with him, we we'll glorify him. Together. Let me tell you what's in my mind. I'm a visual guy. I'm picturing I get up to heaven. And there's like, this, I'm not saying this is accurate, it's just my, 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 my dumb imagination. And there's like this long road that you get, you're kind of walking down, and you get near the front, and you see like this big neon sign that says, Now entering heaven. And it's one of those signs that says, Estimated population, whatever. Okay? Now entering heaven. So you're like, Oh, it's cool. What's in heaven? And then there's like a big neon bright that says, Heaven starring Jesus. Okay? Like the movie thing, starring Jesus. Oh, starring Jesus. I want to get there. Then you get closer. And it says, co-starring Father Anthony. Wow. Co-starring me? Yeah, because I said, if you suffer with me, you'll be glorified with me. So here I am. I'm starring in heaven. Then you could be my co-star. Come sit next to me. Yeah. Oh, but wait a minute, Lord. I forgot I'm sad because when I was on earth, someone called me a bad name. I'm sad because I didn't get that promotion. I'm sad because they weren't nice to me in gym class. Is the glory worth the harassment? We learned it when we were kids, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We need to go back to that mentality, the old sticks and stones mentality, to give you some perspective. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Look, when the Lord is giving this list of things that you could leave, houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, saying anything that you leave for my sake, don't ever think. Don't ever think that I'll, in the end, still owe you one. Because when I repay, I repay. But, this is the but that I would like to leave you with. I said how persecution is an honor. I said how it is a source of blessing. But remember the condition. It's not the persecution. It's your response to the persecution. And if you look at the Coptic church, okay, what has made the Coptic church so strong throughout the years is its response to persecution has always made it stronger, not weaker. That's who we are. That's who we are as a people. That's our history. That's our forefathers. And we need to live up to that set standard that they've set for us. That when the church got hit, it didn't hit back. It never repaid evil for good or evil for evil, but it responded to evil with good, and the church always became stronger. The condition that you remain faithful That you persevere in doing what is right. 
First Peter chapter 4, verse 19 says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good. What I want us to say together is that as a godly person, I should expect some people won't like me, there'll be persecution. However, I commit my soul to doing good and to responding good for evil, to love, to bless, to pray for, to do good. I commit myself to doing that. And I promise you, if you do that, then you will see what it means to say that persecution is a blessing in your life. I remember <clears throat> one time I was reading this book that talks about Christianity in America and about how basically how we've become like watered down Christianity. And we don't take, like we water everything down basically. And we've become basically a bunch of spoiled brats and a bunch of little babies. And I was reading something. It came at a time like... It had just rained, okay, it had rained on a Sunday. And when it rains on Sunday, something that I've, I've always known, and then I found some statistics to prove it, attendance to church goes down when it rains on Sundays, okay? And I always looked at that like, you know what, it, it's raining, and I understand, okay, you know, the shoes and the hair, whatever, like whatever, it rains, but whatever. Then I thought about it, because I read, Okay, it said the church attendance in the United States drops by about 20% when it rains. Man, how pathetic is that? How pathetic is that? How pathetic is that we're like, oh, it's raining. Oh, I should suffer for the Lord and go to church today. And it's not like we're even like walking in the rain. It's like walking from my house to my car, assuming I don't have a garage, okay, in five feet with an umbrella. Oh, but it's raining. What happened to us? What happened to us? We watered down what it means to follow Christ. I compare that to someone like St. Paul. Y'all know the stories. One time St. Paul was preaching. He's getting persecuted. People dragged him out the city. They beat him to a bloody pulp. They threw stones at him. They stoned him. Okay? You know when it says, like, someone was stoned in the Bible? I used to always think it means, like, you know, like little pebbles, and you're like, you know, like, no, no, no. Stoning in the Bible was not little pebbles. They beat you so that you couldn't move and you were down, and then they'd, like, three guys would take, like, a boulder, like a big rock, like three guys holding it, and boom on you. And they would keep on doing that until they thought you were dead. That's what it means by they were stoned, okay? It doesn't mean, like... St. Paul got beaten, got stoned. They stopped because they thought he was dead. He gets up later. He wasn't dead. He shakes the dust off. What does he do? He goes back into the same city to preach some more. The guy was left for dead. They threw the rocks at him. He went back into the city to preach some more. He lost his mind. We, like I said, if it was a threat of rain in the city, we wouldn't have gone in. He went back in. Why? Because he understood this. He understood this. It is an honor to be persecuted for the Lord. It's only temporary, and my reward will much outweigh anything that happens here. Where do you stand on that spectrum? Of the people who don't go to church when it rains? And the people who go back into the city after getting stoned. Everyone is somewhere on the spectrum. Where are you? What does it take? Look at the flip side. What does it take to stop you? What does it take to stop you? The stoning couldn't stop him. So the rain stopped some people. What does it take to stop you? A little word of criticism? Does that stop you? Someone doesn't want to be your friend? That stops you? Someone just looks at you and behind your back? What does it take to stop you? I read a story one time, a true story, about someone who was a missionary in Africa. And he spent his whole life in Africa serving. He lost his wife and his kids while he was serving as a missionary to malaria. So the guy had not just given his own life, he gave the life of his wife and children for, 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 for being a missionary and being an evangelist. 
Eventually, he decides to, to like retire or whatever and come back home. He's old, he's sick, he needs to come back to the United States of America. He gets on a plane and he's coming back to the United States. As he arrives in the airport, he happens to be arriving on the same day that several troops had just arrived back from World War II. This is a long time ago. And all the troops who were coming back from World War II, there was people, like with signs, welcome home, you know, like we love you, like all kinds of signs welcoming them home. He didn't know anyone. No one was waiting for him. He was all by himself. He had to get a cab, take it to like his cousin, whatever it was. So the devil entered in his mind, and he got discouraged. And he thought to himself, I served God my whole life. I gave my wife, I gave my children. What do I get in return? Nothing. No one here cares. No one knows. No one cares. And then he said, as he was thinking that thought and getting that feeling, he says a little voice came into his head, and he heard God saying, Son, you're not, son, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. You won't be in heaven but five minutes. But five minutes. And see all the reward. Until you say to yourself, Man, why didn't I witness more to God? Man, why didn't I endure more? Why was I such a wimp? Look at this. This reward. You won't be there but five minutes. Home. Really home. Till you realize that nothing down here, nothing down here is as important as anything up there. I read a nice quote, but I'll leave you with this thought. Someone said, I'd rather temporarily, temporarily lose with a cause that will ultimately succeed as opposed to temporarily succeed with a cause that will ultimately lose. Good thing. Think to yourself, are you trying to succeed temporarily or are you trying to succeed ultimately? May God give us the strength and the perspective to realize that it's okay to lose today in order to win tomorrow. Let's stand for a prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is so precious to us. Thank you for your word, which always speaks to us, Lord, in such loud ways. Today, Lord, we hear you telling us that to, to, to gain like an eternal perspective on things. And, and Lord, we really pray that you would help us because we're so weak and there's so many things around us to pull our eyes back down to earth and to what people think about us and what people give us and, and to pull our eyes to earthly things. But we pray, Lord, let us to see the things which are not seen because we know the things which are seen are temporary and things which are not seen are eternal. Give us to be heavenly-minded, eternally-focused people to have a bigger head and a bigger mind so that we don't have to look at these little petty things and get all worked up about them, but to see things, Lord, from your perspective. Thank you, Lord, so much for your promises, which are so sweet. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to take away today like one promise from you and, and, and give us to live inside your promises every single day of our lives. Accept our prayers this day in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the intercessions and prayers of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. May the peace of God be with you all.